James Bradley has authored several nonfiction bestsellers focused on the American experience in the Pacific and Asia, including Flags of Our Fathers and his last book, which we will talk about in length today, The China Mirage, The Hidden History of American Disaster in Asia. Mr. Bradley is currently in the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand, and he is joining us via Skype. We welcome him now to the program. Thanks for having me. Hey, great. I know it's very, very early for you there, so thank you for uh, being on the show. Good to be here. Very good. Well, um, let's start with, uh, you know, the impetus of your book. I know you have extensive uh, study, research, and writings about the Pacific Rim and related countries. Could you talk about the book and how, um, what is its contents and what it covers? Oh, man, you have a few hours, Mary? <laughs> well, how about a brief synopsis? How about, how about, how about 30 seconds? Sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, the, good, the Goodreads version. <laughs> the China Mirage refers to something that took place in America, that takes place in America, and that is the American conception of China. We're, you know, but looking back in history, pre-George Washington, we're a Eurocentric country. The Chinese came over to build the railroads in the 1800s, after the railroads, they spread out across the West. And, you know, a Clint Eastwood movie or a John Wayne movie should have Chinese running the hotels, running the bars, the grocery stores, all across the West. But then we enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s, and uh, nice, good American citizens got their guns and cleaned the Chinese out of the West, just, you know, just pushed them into the Pacific Ocean, basically. So it was illegal for someone like me, a white guy born in America, to really know a Chinese. So you're talking about the most populous country in the world, Americans targeted, and you can't come here. We can't know you. So Pearl Buck writes the biggest book of the 1930s. It's the only book of the 20th century to be number one two years in a row. And it's the good earth. And it's about the Chinese. And the Chinese you know, have our Midwestern values, and it becomes such a popular book, and everybody cries, and they make a movie, The Good Earth. Well, The Good Earth had no Chinese actors in it, because it was illegal for Chinese to touch each other, or kiss each other on screen. So we love the idealized image of the Chinese over there, but we don't want them here. And the idealized image of the Chinese over there is that they want to be like America. So turn on the news today, and you'll hear that if we can just get rid of that Communist Party, the Chinese people would be free, and they could rise up and have the government that they want. Well, 200 years ago, that's what America said. If we could just get rid of that corrupt emperor, the Chinese people want to be just like us. You know, they want potluck suppers, and they want Christian churches on every hill. And that's the China mirage, that China is going to change, and China is going to become more American. James, I've been following your uh, podcast, uh, uh, War with China, and uh, I'm going to take uh, the titles of the two most recent uh, podcasts uh, and, and pose them as a question. Uh, how has the U.S. military surrounded China, and why is war with China inevitable? Okay, the first one, why is war with China inevitable? That's not a judgment. That is Michael Clare, K-L-A-R-E. I've interviewed him on our Untold Pacific podcast. Michael Clare told us that the civilian leadership of the United States, multi-generational, has determined that it is inevitable that we're going to go to war with China. And that if you talk to the military, they would say, hey, you know, the, they pointed us this way. I mean, President Obama flew to Australia to announce the pivot to Asia. That was a party time for Raytheon and Lockheed. China, the biggest possible enemy in the world, satellites, high-tech, Navy ships. So it's, it's not a judgment. It's Michael Clare saying that the uh, American leadership sees war with China as inevitable, if that isn't scary. Mm -hmm. And then your other quote is, uh, U.S. military has China surrounded. That comes from an interview with the great John Pilger on our website. And John Pilger, the documentarian, you know, the British Library just devoted a whole room to his life. And John Pilger has done a documentary called The Coming War on China. 
And he shows there with visuals of all the bases surrounding China. I mean, folks, like 50 percent of American taxes go to the military and the military puts these in very expensive bases to surround China. And Americans aren't aware of these maps. It's amazing. Just, Let me just argue a- the other side, if I, if, uh, if you will, just for a uh, moment. I often do this, by the way. I don't necessarily agree with my uh, these own my own positions, but uh, uh, opponents, uh, your opponents would say that uh, China, uh, China's at fault here. China has uh, created all these uh, artificial archipelagos in the Chow, uh, China Sea, um, where they're creating uh, naval bases and uh, military airstrips. They'll say that China is uh, colonizing Africa. They'll say that uh, China has subsidized its own currency to dominate uh, world trade. Um, how would you answer your opponents? I would say my opponent doesn't know much. And it's not my <laughs> opponent. No, I'm not trying to defend China's side. I'm trying to just show history. You know, you've, you, your opponent is just reading the Wall Street Journal for the last four years and has a very narrow view that you, you got to open up the the lens. You know, China's China, the, the emperor stands in Beijing and looks at a thousand years in the past and thousands of years in the future. And how did that Hong Kong get into British hands? It was at the point of a gun by drug runners. It's like the Cali cartel came up and took Staten Island from America at the at the threat of gunpoint. You know, so right. we've got to look at a little history here. As far as those islands in the South China Sea, the emperor says, hey, you know, the the Americans, had, there's been a lot of aggression in that South China Sea. Uh, John McCain was flying from the South China Sea when he crashed in Hanoi. We killed three million Indo-Chinese from that South China Sea. So aggression in the South China Sea uh, has not come from China. And the emperor looks at that South China Sea. If you look it out on the map, that's a highway we have to keep open. America has to keep Highway 95 open from Maine to Florida, national security. And China's going to keep this open. Now, let me talk to the opponent a little more. And I'd say, what the heck are you doing talking about China? China is 6,000 miles away. China is not in San Francisco Bay. China's not in New York Bay. The problem is America way out there, you know, (laughs) thinking that they can tell China what to do. And that happened for a century of humiliation. And the key word for China is sovereignty. The West took China's sovereignty and China fell. Mao rose up and said China's for the Chinese. And this is a very strong chord in the Chinese thinking. Now, now, my fear is that uh, Trump, as as he sees that his numbers are falling in the polls, will um, will in, in, intensify uh, his war talk. Um, war is good for an incumbent president, as you know. And uh, Trump being Trump, a ma- malignant narcissist, if you will, uh, who's not in tune with any reality except his own, might march us down the path to war if for no other reason than to get elected. Do you think that's a possibility? That's a possibility. And again, I don't want to talk politically, but I'd, I'd like to look at the history. The uh, a, a Trump is a Joan Baez peacenik compared to uh, Obama. Huh. And I, I, again, I'm not getting political. Just look at the numbers. Obama's bombing nine Muslim countries at, at one time. You know, Barack drone Obama. So where's the war? You know, uh, Trump was going to go to war with Korea and then with Iran and then invade Venezuela. You know, all these wars were going to happen, but they didn't. Trump's a businessman. What's his number one problem? The economy's on its back. Well, gee, I wonder if China would have anything to do with reviving the American economy. So, no, I don't I, I, I don't see Trump as a warmonger against China in terms of talking tough against China. Yeah, if I ran for president tomorrow, if you nominate me, I've got to start talking tough against China because the polls show 80 to 90 percent of the American people are upset about China. So you're going to hear a lot of anti-China talk, but that's not the leaders. That's the populace. If you've just joined us, we are speaking with James Bradley. He is the author of Flags of Our Fathers, and we're speaking about his last book, the China Mirage, The Hidden History of American Disaster in Asia. We will take your calls for Mr. Bradley, and you can email your questions. Um, James, I was um, curious about how COVID might be uh, 
uh, prompting uh, Trump and Biden and others to um, attack China even further from another angle. Could you explain how COVID's pandemic has affected this idea that we need to go to war? Yeah. Can I go back to the South China Sea for a quick second? Sure, absolutely. And that is, you know, again, and, and you know, maybe front page Wall Street Journal today, you're going to see a blow up picture of an island. Those aggressive Chinese are taking these islands. But open the aperture to the whole Pacific. How did we get that Hawaii? Read my third book. We sent in the Marines and they put bayonets at the queen's neck and she had to walk out of the palace. Guam. We're militarizing. How did we get Guam? We stole it from the Spanish. How did we get the, those bases in the Philippines? Why is Taiwan under the American wing? So, you know, China taking some sand spits. China says, hey, this is nothing. Look at all, look at all this land that America stole. Do our listeners know the history of the biggest base in the Indian Ocean? It's called Diego Garcia. I just interviewed David Vine about Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia, the American military, wanted it as a base, so we came and shot the dogs first, and then picked the people up in trucks and flew them to camps, and they're living in poverty. So just scraped them off their islands so we could build a golf course there. So, you know, it isn't that the Chinese are uh, doing something so unusual. It's that Americans really don't have the whole picture as to what we've done. Now, in terms of COVID, I'm going to leave that one aside because it's so confusing. Who did what and where did it come from and how did it and what time and who told who what? And, you know, that, that still is all to be worked out. My point is the American public is polling like 80, 90 percent dissatisfaction with uh, China. So, yes, every candidate has to punch China in the nose. I want to uh, come back to uh, your book, The China Mirage. I think it's a fascinating premise that uh, that the U.S. Me uh, media uh, uh, has has focused on this disappointment that the American outreach to China over the last 20 years didn't quote unquote liberalize China and make it quote unquote more American. I agree with that. I think that the United States has as its chief export uh, besides war um, its culture, its pop culture, um, and I think you know the fact that you know. Cardi B doesn't run in China and Snoop Dogg doesn't run in China uh, where it does in Africa and, and France and, and Indonesia. I think it ups upsets some people, uh, some people here in the States uh, that, that this is a very uh, that this is a great the great delusion. And it's a continuing delusion that this mirage in the American mind that China will become something more like America is something that we should expect as we uh, export our culture abroad. Do you care to elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, what is happening right now happened uh, a few times before. This is cyclic. Let's go back to the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt said that this dictator by the name of Chiang Kai-shek, who slept on above uh, prisons of his, of his political opponents, was a great Democrat. And people who read Time magazine, you know, Henry Luce, the owner of Time magazine, put Chiang Kai-shek on the cover more than uh, General MacArthur, more than FDR, more than Hitler. So Chiang Kai-shek was the great Christian leader who was going to bring, who was going to make China Christianized if we just give him a billion dollars more. And then another billion dollars. And China's going to be Christian. And Pearl Buck said so. And Franklin Roosevelt said so. And the missionary said so. And it's going to be great. And then all of, and then Mao arose in pajamas and said, hey, all you foreign devils out and kick Chiang Kai-shek out to Taiwan. Oh, my God. What happened to the Christianity? We were so disappointed. We worked with the Chinese and they didn't become just like us. They're not eating hamburgers. Right. And we shut off American relations with the number one country in the world, with the most populous country in the world. Look at the book. I'm not kidding you. We took every State Department employee that spoke Chinese and fired them. That's a great way to understand a country. China wasn't closed. We closed ourselves off to China. Nixon wasn't the first to extend the hand. Look in the book. Mao Zedong is writing to Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower. Mao Zedong has his hand out for 20 years, and finally Nixon, uh, you know, uh, shakes it. 
So this McCarthyism that started when Mao came in, McCarthyism is based in uh, hating the Chinese, by the way. It's the same thing that is happening now. Here's my proof. Last week, Maria Bartolomo, a big finance commentator on cable news, had a State Department spokesperson on, and they're talking about how terrible China is, you know, terrible, terrible, terrible. And then midway, Maria says, you know, this really all started when America allowed China into the WTO, World Trade Organization, and then we thought, hey, the Chinese will see this and say, we like this democracy stuff. Right. And then the, the State Department spokesperson says, yes, we tried for 40 years and it didn't work. <laughs> so there's the China mirage. We're going to, you know, it, it, at one time it was the missionaries were going to be so great, they're going to go to China and then China is going to become Christian because the American missionaries are so wonderful. Now we're sending our capitalists, you know, guys from Walmart and, and uh, whatever. And then I guess they're so wonderful that the Chinese should just start, you know, modeling our system. Well, the Chinese have a system. It's the emperor system. It's not the Communist Party. It's an ancient emperor system. The emperor is President Xi and a few people on top. It's a committee. The Communist Party is the largest uh, meritocracy in the world. There's 80 million people in it. It's a mandarin, you know, the mandarins of old. So Chinese has their system and they're proud of their system and they're putting 50 million people a year into the middle class and they're looking at America, which is draining its middle class. So there's factual reasons why China thinks, you know, we got a good system. We don't need a young barbarian country only 300 years old with an untested system telling us what to do. I've, I've heard it said in intelligence circles that get, uh, Give China another 20 years and they'll be the only real superpower in the world. Uh, the, the EU will have collapsed. Uh, the United States will have collapsed. Uh, if you look here, right here in the United States, even in the last month, we've you know issued four or five trillion dollars in economic stimulus with uh, and that's not backed up by one dollar in new tax revenues. it's It's the treasury issuing debt that's put on the books of the Federal Reserve system. And uh, that's why gold has gone from, uh, when I moved here to Mendocino County 20 years ago, gold was selling at $278 an ounce. Today it's selling, uh, I'm looking at my screen right now, I trade gold at $1,752. Um, you know, that's, that's a, an enormous um, uh, red flag for me that the dollar is due for a massive devaluation and that uh, we're headed towards uh, another great recession, if not another great depression. This will leave China as the only real superpower in the world, in the opinion of many. What do you think? I think, first of all, I own gold and silver. If you are, if you have dollars in your bank account, just like you said, you know, if you're on a pile of dollars, those dollars are smoldering. They are burning and they are going down. And you better protect yourself. Is my message to my friends and and listeners on my on my podcast site. China being the only power. See, China doesn't look at it that way in terms of a superpower and then we're going to invade Argentina and then we'll have troops in Iraq and then, you know, we'll, we'll bomb Rio de Janeiro if they don't. That, that's not China, China's job. China sent out uh, huge fleets of ships. I mean, these, these fleets were bigger than anything. They were only equaled by World War II. This was back in the 13th century, I believe. It's very famous. And they go all over the world, and they come back, and they say to the emperor, all we found was barbarians and bad food. And the emperor burnt all the ships, and you know, China decided not to go outward. The capital of China is in the middle of the country, Beijing. It's a land-based country. So other than their borders, Tibet, Taiwan, South China Sea, you know, their perimeter— they're not interested in, in occupying India. You know, they're not, in, in the documentary, one of the guys in there, I'm in there, that John Pilger did, they ask a Chinese guy, um, you know, does China want to conquer the world? And he laughs and he says, China's not that stupid. <laughs> James, you know, it's, we have it's very expensive. So the one superpower, I wouldn't worry about it. If I was American, I would say we can, you know, it, it makes sense that a, a population of 1.4 billion has a bigger economy than 330 million. That makes sense. James, we, the, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we have a caller who would like to ask a question. Caller, go ahead. 
Uh, thank you so much. I first of all want to say how very much I appreciate the history that you presented, Mr. Bradley. It's really important at the list that we all know that and remember it, especially the McCarthy era history. But I do want to go back to John's question about war. And it does take two, as you've pointed out. The Chinese may not be interested, but we have allies we might use. We have, a, the, I think, with the political election, we can't underestimate desperation on the part of American politicians. And Hong Kong is providing a really good opportunity to send in some kind of message that could lead to violence and to some kind of war, even if it's not an all-out war. Uh, so I'd really appreciate a little bit more reflection on that possibility and the kind of incident that might trigger it. Thank you, caller. The, the geniuses that I interviewed said that war, what they're afraid of is that war could happen by accident. Exactly. In other words, there's no there's no leader. Xi or Trump are not going to say bomb each other. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. You know that would be a worldwide war. Yeah, by accident but, on purpose, though, perhaps from our perspective. Yeah. So yeah, there could be an accident in terms of either leader going to kinetic war. Uh, you know that's highly unlikely. But listen to John Pilger's interview. He's you know he says we're already at war, kinetic war, satellite war, trade war, currency war. And yes, these often do lead to war wars. So I'm not minimizing anything. There's two huge balloons in a closed room. One is the U.S., one is China, and they're bouncing around. And it's it's inevitable that they will touch each other. And, you know, with this lack of understanding between the two countries right now, uh, yes, there could be war. How, how xenophobic is uh, Joe Biden? <laughs> <laughs> You know, Joe's got all his laundry with the Chinese, his son with the 1.5 billion. I mean, people, I don't know, it's its like they're stuck in the 60s. You know, the Democrats are pe peaceful and the Republicans are warlike. I don't know. Obama and Biden, that was a war machine. Those were big wars and less war with Trump. So I'm just, I'm not supporting either side. I'm just looking at the facts. James, you have referenced the uh, uh, John Pilger documentary, and I'm not sure people understand that it is available on YouTube. I watched it uh, a couple nights ago. Would you talk about that and how folks might follow you in the next two or so minutes that we have with you? Well, John Pilger's documentary is called The Coming War on China, and it's on YouTube. And the value of it is there, there is that you hear from uh People, you know, in China, John asks good questions. But the big thing is he opens up the lens and shows Americans what they can't see in their media. And that is the billions and billions of dollars we're spending to surround China and point armaments at them. It's not China being aggressive. China's not, you know, China didn't build a base in Canada and Mexico and uh, have ships in San Francisco Bay. We're the ones that are poking on the coast of China and they don't like it sovereignty is a sensitive issue. In terms of uh, being in contact with me, you can go to untoldpacific.com. It's the word untoldpacific.com. We're telling stories about the Pacific that have never been told. I went to school in Japan in 1974, and I've been in and out of Asia since then. You can go to jamesbradley.com. But yes, we have a series uh, called War with China, and we have a series called uh, The American Dollar, because I think those are the two big concerns Americans should have. Number one, the, the biggest financial problem you have is in your pocket, and you better look at that dollar. Number two, um, we're getting very aggressive with China. President Obama said the United States is going to pivot to Asia. James Bradley, you've been a terrific guest, and I, I do hope that you will uh, come back on and, and speak with us. And come back and talk about uh, Korea. Correct, correct. There's uh, a lot to talk. There's a lot to talk about out here. Vietnam had no COVID cases. How is that possible? They're right next to China. Wow. You know, my, da my daughter lives in Taiwan. They never had a day of lockdown. How is that possible? There's a lot to talk about here out in Asia. It's, it's exciting now. Well, we hope you'll come back and, and, and fill our listeners in on this and other things. Again, you, your latest book is The China Mirage, The Hidden History of American Disaster in Asia. And we do hope that we can 
steer our listeners to your YouTube video. Thank you so much, James Bradley. Good to be here. Thank you. That's our show for today. This is Heroes and Patriots, John uh, Sakowitz and Mary Massey, and we hope to be back first Thursday in July. John? First Thursday in July, and I want to thank uh, all our listeners and underwriters for supporting your community radio station, KMUD. Thank you.